Let's continue. But the world has changed in the last generation. What's changed? It's the information age. It's the internet. With access to information on the internet, Stephen Snow says we can't continue that pattern. I think we need to continue to be more open. In other words, there's still things they're not telling you. Yes, our leaders are dishonest, but you can't call them out as dishonest. The thing with Elder Holland, I did a podcast episode titled Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. It's cute and it's harsh, but I show five times using Elder Holland's own audio juxtaposed against the actual data that shows that he is in fact lying. So you can again say my tone isn't okay. You can say I'm being too harsh, but the reality is he did lie on five occasions. The guy has a problem with honesty. And this is a guy who I considered a friend who reached out to me. The attached letter was received in my office a little over a week ago. Title, this is to Marlon K. Jensen from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. Uh, while I was on assignment in Africa, would you be good enough to handle, as you feel appropriate, this letter from Bishop William J. Reel, who is currently serving as a bishop of the Sandusky, Ohio Ward? Please express to him my love and best wishes. Tell him I would respond personally were it not for other demands, including a grueling trip to Africa. I'm concerned about such people. I've spoken to Elder Holland. I considered him a friend, and yet I also put my foot down and say he did lie. Should I be punished for telling the truth? Should I be punished about talking about our messy history? Should I be punished for telling a leader and saying that guy's lying when the data imposes that he did? The issue is not about the lies, though. Sadly, it's whether anyone like me is allowed to shine a light on them. If that light imposes that we each get really uncomfortable and our religion must come face to face with its unhealthiness. Stories in our church that aren't true, by the way. Brigham Young's transfiguration. The two first witnesses to that weren't even in town the day it happened. John D. Lee, Orson Hyde. Both of them in their journals say they weren't in town. They're the first two guys to tell us that that transfiguration occurred. The Sweetwater Crossing. When we talk about these three 18-year-old boys, they weren't 18, there were more than three, and they died so long after, and yet we try to tell a story that they died so soon after, and Brigham Young promised they'd be in the selected kingdom. That's not true. The seagulls and crickets, seagulls eat crickets all the time. And how Brigham Young took control of the church, I would challenge each of you to go home tonight and do some serious research on how Brigham Young took control of the church. It's not the story we were told. No, and by the way, nobody along the way has ever accused me of lying or fabricating these details. And when I share them with anybody in the church, including apostles and church historians, they admit that what I'm telling is the truth. Only that it's unacceptable to say it. It's unacceptable to share the truth. I have through this entire process maintained integrity, vulnerability, and authenticity. I have only spoken the truth. So, President, I recognize that everyone in this room, their responsibility is to make sure the procedures are followed. It's your job to decide whether I'm an apostate or not. Tonight, you get to decide whether seeking and also telling the truth are acceptable endeavors in Mormonism. You get to decide whether the facts matter or whether we simply need to protect a story and authorities, no matter how harmful or dishonest that story or those authorities are. Brethren, tonight you may have thought it was me that was on trial, but it was never me. It's the church that's on trial. It's its integrity. It's its honesty. It's the church that's on trial, and in part, each of you as you sit in judgment of me. That's all I've got to say. So as you guys can see. All right. So that, uh, that was the conclusion of your main remarks. Is that right? Yeah, that was the conclusion. Then my wife speaks for a moment, which we'll, we'll hear in a second. And then uh, um, there's a short pause after she gets done that I quickly grab hold again and try to get a few more words out before before he wants to move out of this time of allotted to me to speak. So overall, what, what, what did you perceive from the body language of the people who listened up to that point? Yeah. So the entire time, I mean, again, the guys are looking intently. Um, I had no expectation of reaching the entire room. 
uh, as, as you know, you and I talked and other people throughout that day, as we had conversations, you're, you're really hoping maybe there's just one uh, who will listen intently and say like, oh, that didn't feel right. Something's wrong. I'm going to go look stuff up. Um, but as I went through that meeting, I mean, people were, the people in that room, again, five, six, seven, eight of them, whatever it is, are, you can tell you're not going to change where they're at. For two or three, they look distressed. Um, for another two or three, you could tell that on some level they were uncomfortable with what was being said. Um, and again, I, I'll let the listener decide. I think I laid it out as smoothly and coherently as one could hope to do. Uh, were there mistakes? Absolutely. Um, but I'm so, so happy with how this all went. Um, and then as we get into the q and A, I I had, had no... I had no expectations that we would get into a conversation afterward where they would start asking questions and give me space to talk and was extremely thrilled that that happened. Um, this, this for me as well as it could go. Yeah. Because in, in my experience uh, and from what I've heard from others excommunicated, you know, they make this statement, you're on trial here, not us. We will be asking the questions of you you are not to ask us any questions. Right. And right, but oh, there was no conversation. It was, they read the charges. We took our hour. We were dismissed. There was no conversation at all. That yeah. seems to be something that was unique about uh, your situation. And I assume that will probably not, never happen again. Um, <laughs> the church will recognize like, oh, let's make sure we make it clear that that's not to occur. Yeah, and I guess we'll see maybe a little bit why in just a second. All right, so should we go to Amanda's comments? Yeah, let's do it. All right. This is Amanda Real, Bill Real's uh, wife. My incredible wife. I'm a smart man. He does not say things just to say them. He loves to learn. He loves history. So like you said, you know, he came to this he just thought it was the coolest story ever. He wanted to know about it. So that's what he did. He learned about it. And when he found out that it just did not add up, he was alone. He didn't even tell me for a while. And he didn't tell me because he first heard of the stories of where marriages crumbled, divorces happened, families are now broken. There's, we get so many messages and visits about how he's helped people personally for their marriages or help them feel not alone, help them feel like they're not crazy. He's validated them. Time and time again, we get these messages. Just out here tonight, a young lady said, well, back in February, I was on the brink of divorce. And thanks to you, I... My marriage is saved, and we're happy, and we're together. We get these all the time. And so now, because Bill has only sought out truth and knowledge, my eternal marriage, my way back to the celestial kingdom, it's on the line. Not because he wants to sin or that he has sinned. It's because he wanted truth. And search for knowledge. Uh, can you share with us anything Amanda shared with you about what it was like for her to be in that room? So again, my wife is not um, not the extrovert. She's not the person comfortable in a crowd, especially with strangers talking. But she remarked to me afterward that um, she was confident as well. She felt really um, safe and calm. Uh, as she shared those remarks. And I think you can hear it in her voice. She's not shaky. She's not nervous. Uh, she calmly lays out this storyline um, of the people that we've helped and reached, uh, the people that she's visibly seen sit with me and share their stories, um, and some of the uh, comments we've gotten back about the good that it's done. Uh, I thought she did a beautiful job and just was proud of her. Yeah, beautiful. 
All right. I'm glad they let her speak. At least they let her speak, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and man, it, even to let her come in the room, I wasn't even sure until the last few days that they were going to let her be there. Yeah. Yeah, it was good they let her in. All right. Let's hear your follow-up words after Amanda. I've not done anything that's immoral. I'm not here because I'm caught in adultery. I'm not here because I did some kind of immoral sin. I'm here because I told the truth, and we're not really supposed to talk about that here. So now we see what you guys do. Now we see if you're willing to accept the fact that this gets really messy. And are you willing to let somebody stay among you who knows it, who knows it doesn't add up, and who can point you to the very sources that determine that this isn't what it claims to be? That doesn't mean it's true or not true. It just means that we framed it in a way to be faith promoting, and that doesn't hold up. So if apostles have lied, can you excommunicate a guy who shines a light on their lying? That would seem like that would be a lack of integrity on your and the church's part, not mine. So let's see what happens. I'm done. No. Yes. Yeah, so, do you mind if I tell you? This is my tribe. Okay. So why don't we now, and, and there are some listeners who basically expressed they were they were they wished that they could hear Amanda's um, comments a little bit more clearly. Please know that that the transcript for this entire disciplinary council wasn't it transcribed by Amanda? Uh, no, it wasn't transcribed by Amanda. It wasn't really transcribed by me either. Although I was given a copy once the transcript was created uh, by an outside uh, by by whoever you know had their hands on the audio. Uh, once the transcript was created, it was sent to me for a final viewing and correction before uh, Radio Free Mormon released it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I did do a little looking over, did do a little looking over and trying to fix a few things, but, um, but yeah, it, it, um, it, some of these things probably didn't get fixed. I know the closing prayer is pretty weird looking as far as the words used. It, it doesn't represent what was accurately said, but the rest of it, I think you can make out enough as things are being said with the static to know that the transcript is quite accurate. Yeah. So for listeners who want to hear any of that, but also want to hear what you can make out from the exchange, just uh, check out that transcript. We'll include a link to it in this exchange that we're listening to right now. There's a comment from a high councilman that says something to the effect of, he wanted to know if in all your research you found out um, that the church's foundation is Sandy. Is that what you heard? You talk about the, the audio we're just about ready to listen to? Yeah. So the first comment the guy wants to ask is, why didn't you, why don't you just resign? Why don't you just call it quits? Why, why stay in something that you don't believe is what it claims to be? Right. And so that's, and so you give that answer. Yeah. All right. So that's the first one. Yeah. So let's, um, let's turn to that now. I've served in this church. I've served these people. This is the language and the symbols in which I operate in this world. One doesn't want, so in, in the Jewish faith, people leave Orthodox Jew and they become a Reformed Jew. There's a space for them to be less literal. There's a space for them to still belong, but not have to buy into the story fully. In Mormonism, we don't have that. We, we decide like, this is the narrative we're gonna hold to, and anybody who publicly says something different, we're gonna start to distance ourselves from them. This is my tribe. I wanna be here. Now, this is not a healthy space for me to be active at the moment, but my hope is in 20 years, the church will come around. It'll create a new story, which it, by the way, just published the Saints book, which is a new history. If you go read that, it's not the story you grew up with. So the choice you have to make is, can you let me be a member and be honest to what I find while the church works out the fact that its story is inaccurate, not mine? This is my tribe. So most of us, so that we know. Okay, so, so that was uh, you talking about the church uh, being your tribe. Right. Um, what, what can we say about the question that was asked right before your next comment? Um, let's the see. The transcript here. says it's leaders. It's not true today, 20 years from now, when they tell the whole story. 
Anything yeah, and, I, and I don't remember the exact question, but he's asking, like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, if we're not telling the true story now, then how does this all unfold? Um, and I'm just trying to share with him, I guess, a, a little bit of kind of leaving a binary world. Okay, let's hear, let's hear that answer. I know about how the brain develops. Most of us stay in a black and white world. We see the world very binary. There's us and them. There's black and white. There's cat people and there's dog people. As people mature, as their brain develops, and it only happens about 20% of the population, they become less binary. They don't see the world in black and white terms. I've gone through that process myself. Did you teach your kids Santa Claus? You didn't. But I'm guessing if I went around the room, people would say, yes, I did. And Santa Claus is a lie. But there's truths inside lies. There's importance in myth. And myth binds communities together. So we know that when a tribe gets to be 150 people or more, you have to have myth stories to hold them together. The trouble is that a myth story isn't true, but if a tribe stays around long enough, it takes those myth stories and it makes them true. It makes those stories understood to be true stories, even though when they first were created, they were just myths. So I see truth in Mormonism, even if I don't see Mormonism as true the way you see it as true. Does that make sense? Like, I'm, in other words, I'm still teaching my kids Santa Claus, even though I know the story doesn't hold up. Because my kids get something from it. There's value in learning myths, even if for a while you believe them to be literal. We don't, shouldn't kick people out because they teach their kids Santa, Santa Claus. It, that makes no sense. So in a binary world, we say, like, if you believe, stay in, and if you don't, get out. But what I'm suggesting is Mormonism, as time goes on, and I think you're already seeing it, McConkie Mormonism's gone. Joseph Fielding Smith Mormonism's gone. We don't talk about the Earth being 6,000 years old or Cain being Bigfoot. Those things are disappearing. The reality is we're moving into a space where we're going to allow less literal belief. If you go out right now and watch the last 10 talks given in the last three months by church historians and scholars, you'll notice they've stopped using the word translation when referring to the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon. They now call it a revelation. In other words, it came completely out of Joseph Smith's own head. We still want to say it's inspired, but we're no longer saying he, he translated the characters on these documents into another document so that we could read it. So again, you say, why don't I belong? And I say, this is my home. And so it's not about whether I resign or not. It's about whether you're going to make space for someone to be a non-literal believer who also shines a light on the truth to stay. There's a, there's a lot of people out there. I get a million downloads a year. There's news agencies that have already covered it, and there's more reporters coming tomorrow. It's not me. They're, right now, what they're, the story they're looking at is whether people will let guys like me tell the truth about our leaders and about our story and whether we get to stay or not. That's being decided right this moment. So far, every time it's been excommunication, 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 and we send the people saying these very same facts out the door. If, if anybody says I'm not saying a fact, I welcome it. I'm happy to sit down with any one of you, President, you included, and take anything I say and show you the original source and show you that our church teaches an accuracy. So can I be a non-literal believer who shines a light on the truth and stay in this church. That, I don't get to decide that. You do. I remember when I sat down with Elder Holland, um, I had two lunches with him, and I, I really didn't know what to ask him because I didn't want to embarrass my brother who set up the meeting by asking him about polyandry or peep stones or whatever. So the question I asked Elder Holland was, do you want people like us in the church? And he was so emphatic at the time, almost pounding the table, saying, we want you in this church. We need you in this church. Um, and that was his answer to me. But he also said in another interview or another meeting, just don't go out and buy a printing press. And what he meant was, is you can be a non-literal believer in the church, just don't talk openly about it, especially right. not with a podcast platform. And that's, that's what we violated bill that's what we did wrong right but so if we tell if we as a church tell an inaccurate story then the people who know that the story is inaccurate their job's not to talk about that publicly and this idea that you can hold a perspective uh and you're free to hold it you just can't talk about it well guess what like 
people in Nazi Germany had that same privilege. It's not a privilege. Anybody can hold a belief in their head and not share it publicly. Like that happens to all human beings everywhere. The trouble is when you get into an unhealthy system, it's when you get punished for sharing uh, a perspective that doesn't match the story of that system. Um, the church didn't give you any privilege. The church essentially said, look, we're lying. We're not telling an accurate story, but you're not allowed to tell anybody that. And if you do, we'll punish you. It's nonsense. Yeah. Yep. That's a problem. They've got to stop it. Okay. So at this point in the interview, uh, somebody is telling you uh, that your method of criticism is the yeah. problem. So what he gets into here is he's making a comment about, it's not the fact that you're talking about these things, Brother Real. It's how you're talking about them. Um, we have better ways for this, better ways to, to address these issues than for you to say the things you say. Of course, you and I both know there is no better way. There's no valid method of recourse. So that's what I go into next. Yeah. So let's listen to that now. Yeah. Every other way has been tried. Whenever somebody starts to speak up in the church and talk about this stuff, the church starts to put pressure on local leaders to do something. Um, again, I would challenge you, the only way you're going to understand that, because you're not going to understand that story unless you walk across the other side and you ask those people nicely, say, look, before I make any decision on Brother Real, tell me your story. Spend an hour. Is my salvation worth an hour out there talking to people? Go ask them their stories. What they're going to say is they tried every other way. And the church's culture is such, and it's sponsored by the leaders, the church's culture is such that one cannot have doubts and questions in this church without beginning to feel shame, without parents beginning to shame their children, without wives beginning to threaten divorce with their husbands. It's unhealthy. So you say, like, why don't we try a different way? It's not working. These people are crying and they're falling apart and they don't know what to do and they feel alone. When, they're, when they discover this stuff, they're the only person in their ward. They're the only person in their state. And luckily, now we're to a time with the internet age that it's two or three or four families in every ward. I bet every one of you knows somebody who stepped back. Ask them their story. It fell apart. So you ask for a better way, and I say, we need, we need to start speaking up because these people deserve validation. These people deserve us going like, wow, that must have been hard to lose your faith and have it fall apart. Will you tell me an effective way? I think well. The way I want to approach it. Elder Ballard says we're not hiding anything. Can we tell these folks too? Like we tried a different process. We sent five questions up to a 70. That 70 sent those five questions right back to him and said we're not going to answer those. And that's when the I would welcome those answers. That's a dismissal. It's easy to say I'm not interested in finding, in finding answers. That's not fair. I've spent 20 years trying to find answers. So, Bill, have I tell us what the exchange is with the stake president here. So the stake president, to my face, said, uh, we sent your five questions up. They came back. The, the 70s said nobody higher up is going to try to answer those questions. Uh, they want me to try to answer those questions to you, but I'm not going to answer them either. I don't know a darn thing about the history of the church. You know a lot more than I do. And so it would be silly for me to even try to answer these. So in this meeting for the first time, he's claiming that the leaders told him they're working on these questions and they're going to give him good answers. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this kind of got in the way now, and now I'm going to be excommunicated, and so now there's no need to try and answer those. Uh, I would challenge the church to still answer those questions for my stake president, because you and I and everybody listening right now knows there's not good answers to those five questions. And those five questions, by the way, are posted on the website, Mormon Discussion Podcast. Dot org should be on the front page. If you scroll down, maybe six, seven, eight posts, it should be my five questions sent up to church leadership. Uh, you can read those five. You and I read them on our last interview. Um, they're unanswerable. The church can pretend it was going to answer those questions for Bill Real. I wish the church would answer them for anybody. Uh, I'm out of the way, but there's still thousands and thousands of people who would love to know the answers to those questions. So LDS Church, you're welcome to still answer those. I, I highly doubt you will. Uh, because you have no good answer. And I want to include a link to that in, um, 
in our show notes. So again, the title is what? Uh, I have to look it up here, but it's going to be five questions sent up to church leadership. Okay, uh, I've, I've and maybe the listeners can kind of help along here as they're listening. Uh, put these links kind of in the conversation as well. I found it. I found it. I'll go cool. ahead and add it. Uh, because it's there's um, also there's also a list of like 25 questions which is a post right next to it those questions were uh, viewed by my stake president and he admitted that he didn't have an answer to any of those 25 24 <laughs> 24 there we go all right i'll share those two um in the show notes now what yeah. we're about to hear i think is and i think you think is, is some of the most important it's the most important part of the exchange. Is that right? Do you want to set this next part up? Yeah. So I want to put my stake president on the spot because these charges are so general and I've been so truthful in terms of the things I'm being, um, that the, that's used as evidence against me that I now want to put him on the spot and make him tell me and tell the room why I'm being excommunicated. And you'll see here, I think I want to, I want to lay this out because I want you to hear it. Notice that I tell him that he's excommunicating me for calling Elder Holland a liar. You'll then hear him say that that's not the reason he's excommunicating me. So then I'll ask him, then tell me one reason I'm being excommunicated. And then he tells me it's for calling Elder Holland a liar. So he contradicts himself. And then um, I, I ask him, even if he lied, and then the stake president's answer, I think, is just a money, a money quote. All right. Um, and and we're only including the audible parts. So we'll just, we'll need, you know, you to help fill in what happens. Is that all right? Sure. Absolutely. All right. So let's go back to share and we'll hit play. I've been dishonest. Have I been dishonest? So you, but you're going to have to communicate me on, I don't know. You get that, right? Like, I don't know. You might be telling the truth. You might not, but yeah. So you shouldn't excommunicate somebody on I don't know. Again, we're not talking about the truth of what you're saying. No, no, calling Elder Holland a liar. That's not exactly. That's true. Yes. That's not why we are Which Which particular thing am I being excommunicated for? Like, let's get one specific thing where we say, look, you cannot say this. You cannot call anybody a liar. Mm. Even if, you know, somebody in a position as an apostle, as a prophet, you know we hold those Even if they lie. Okay, I'm glad. That's beautiful. <laughs> Why'd you call that beautiful? <laughs> because it was it was perfect, right? Like he's admitting, Bill, even if these guys lied, and even if you're honest and telling them they're a liar, you're not allowed to do that in the church. That's grounds for excommunication. So the truth isn't valuable in Mormonism. Loyalty and obedience is what's valued. And so it's like beautiful, like perfect. Thank you so much for giving me the fact that telling the truth isn't what really counts in this whole thing. What counts is that these guys get deference. These guys get people being loyal and obedient to them and they send their tithing money to them. Not, whether we tell the truth or not is secondary. And anytime we tell the truth and that hurts the narrative of the church, that's punishable. But this guy, for him to say that, I never expected in a million years I could get him to say this. And what he essentially said was, Brother Real, you've done nothing wrong but tell the truth, but telling the truth in this church is punishable. Yeah, and, it, and, and again, I liked what you said at the very beginning of this episode. These guys are kind of victims because we have Elder Oaks specifically saying in the 21st century that it's wrong to criticize a leader of the church, even if the criticism is accurate. Yeah, and but so how just enforcing the rules of the brethren state, which is never criticize us yet. And you and I both know the only way to deconstruct this thing is to present the data to show these guys have been deceptive and dishonest time after time after time. So if you can't criticize them, then you cannot as an insider help somebody else deconstruct the BS that this system is built on. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, that was a pretty, I think that was probably one of the most important moments in the exchange. Is that right? Yeah. I, again, nobody, and you'll see this as we go on to the next one too, which is a money shot or a money quote here along uh, a little ways further. It, you're going to sense like these guys can't take any of my integrity away. They can't diminish my honesty. Um, they're acknowledging at every turn, you're smart. 
You know this stuff tenfold better than we do. You've laid it out beautifully. And if these things are true, it's a deep problem for the church. Yeah. All right. Let's hear the conversation continue. You guys see that, right? If, a, if, if an apostle lies and a member shines a light on it and that apostle is unwilling to acknowledge he lied, it's the member who shines a light on it who gets excommunicated. That is a lack of integrity in this system. There's, there is no valid recourse for those people to get their questions answered. Everybody else. We're just talking about the facts. I don't care about public opinion. The facts. Well, on every single issue, if, if we are, you, you bring up the LGBTQ community, and yeah. the church just swings around to whatever is popular and whatever whatever everybody else wants to do. What, what foundation is that? What is the purpose of any of this? And if, Name one doctor in this church that hasn't changed. I didn't want to be too bad. Right? Do you agree there's unhealthy systems where there is no healthy way to address? You know, this is the Lord's church on earth. Yeah. Well, we're in a system where leaders don't step forward and say we messed up. Name, name an instance. Elder McConkie in 1978 does a little bit of that. Elder Ruchdorf says we've made mistakes, some of which may have violated doctrine or principles. But we don't get anybody who says, yeah, you're right. I lied. Yeah, you're right. I, I messed up. You're right. I thought I had the Lord's will and I didn't. So the trouble is there's people out there are hurting and nobody validates them. Nobody takes the time to say like, man, it wasn't that you tried the least. It's that you tried so hard to make it work and it didn't. So I hear you. But in a church run by Jesus Christ, we ought to have some integrity. So it's two stories. It's two stories. The church was the probably ought to set this in the up world to 17 year old. Okay, go ahead. Um, the, so they sense they're losing, and, and again, this is my gut feeling. I, I'm, I'm sharing only my perspective. They sense they're losing if we talk about the issues. So the one guy jumps in and he says, I want to ask something different. I want to ask, what does Mormonism mean to you? Uh, what, is, what is Mormonism to you? And I then go into my next statement, and what I do is I want to separate this into two things. Um, I want to acknowledge that 17-year-old me, uh, that Mormonism was the, and, and I say this in a statement, I don't say this in this audio, but Mormonism was the lie I needed to believe in in order to change my life for the better. So Mormonism to 17-year-old me was beautiful, but Mormonism to 32-year-old me and after uh, I only learned more and more how unhealthy and toxic and hurtful it is to those who don't fit in the box. Okay. Here we go with the next part. Because I bought it and I, I believed it with every bit of my being and I lived it. I, I showed up at every move. I showed up at every service project. You don't, you don't, again, you can call it pride, but on some level, you don't make bishop at 29 unless you're doing Mormonism to the best of your ability. And I was. But to me, so there's that 17 year old me to 32 where it worked beautifully. But the moment you stop seeing us and them and you start seeing there's human beings both in and out of the church, you start to have compassion and empathy for people who are different. So I have a friend who their gay son almost killed himself. I have other friends whose kids did take their lives. If we're going to protect leaders and excommunicate truth tellers while kids take their lives, what message is that? If, if the, and just the, other two, the only way real changes happen in the church is when somebody at the bottom shines a light on it. We changed our interviews a little bit when Sam Young starts talking. We start making room for women to talk in general conference when Kate Kelly raises a voice. We start putting out gospel topic essays when John DeLynn asks questions. Every one of these shifts and changes where we become healthier happens when people like me stand up and say, the truth matters. So 17 to 32, it was beautiful. And from 32 on, I realized how much we hurt people who don't fit the mold how much we damage them, and we even cause them to take their lives. We cause their spouses to divorce them because we make them other. They're no longer one of us. And we tell, like, let's, let's circle the wagons. That guy belongs over here, and we're us. It has to stop. Tonight, you can say, from here on out, we're going to value the truth. 
and we're going to start having empathy and sympathy for people who are hurting that this falls apart for. We're no longer going to shame them. We're no longer going to distance them as other. We're going to start saying, you're Mormon. If you can't make it work, then your beliefs, I don't care. This is a church where everybody truly can fit in. Those people out there, they just walked away because they feel alone. Nobody validated them. Nobody made them feel. So it's two different stories. If you, if you ignore the history and you ignore the harm the church does, it works wonderfully, as Elder Uchtdorf said. The moment you open up your mind to say, is this really hurting people unnecessarily? Mormonism becomes very toxic and unhealthy. And I'm living in both of those worlds where I love what it did for me, but I don't like what it's doing to me and others right now. Do I care too much? My integrity is not in question here. No, my, my tone, maybe. Yeah, my, my, my tone might be in question, but my integrity is not on the line here. Nobody ever has said, I've not done anything immoral, and I've not done anything untruthful. We made that very clear. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I, I appreciate your sincerity. I really think that you you have researched. Um, I know a lot of the stuff that you brought up tonight. Yeah. I've been aware of a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how do you, knowing what you feel is, is correct about the prophet, how do you feel about him? Is he a prophet? Did the Lord call him? Did he say, did he see what he said he saw? Um, is the Book of Mormon the only correct book on the face of the earth, as the prophet Joseph Smith said? So I'm going to answer your question by focusing on the Book of Mormon. I still love the Book of Mormon. Do I believe is it, it is an ancient historical text? No. But I think it's scripture. I still feel... Do you believe he translated it? I don't think the church anymore claims he translated it. I think the church is in the midst of acknowledging it contains I too much. Disagree. I disagree. I don't mean to be. I know. And the trouble, I know, and the trouble is that you're going to have to find out over the next 15 years because the church is already walking back from it being a literal translation to it being a revelation out of Joseph Smith's head. And that's the words from our own church coming out in the last six months. And, and if you want, I'll be happy to send you the references for where the church is I, saying those things. Yeah, I, I understand. So, so it's scripture. Is Joseph Smith a prophet? Did he see what he said he saw? I wouldn't define him as prophet the way you would. But if we define prophet as somebody who pushes against the status quo and calls us to connect with the divine, and while we like to say Jesus spoke to him and that's what makes him a prophet, I think history actually shows that prophets are people who perceive some dysfunction in the status quo and they push back. And they generally do it in ways that try to connect us to the divine. Um, and I think Jesus did this all the time. Jesus is constantly pushing against his own true and living church of his day. If you see who Jesus criticizes, it's the religious leaders of his church, which we believe is the true and living church of his day. Jesus himself seems to have no problem saying, those leaders in my church, they're one off. They're missing the mark. And yet we, we have no problem with something like that. When Joseph Smith says things like uh, he understood that none of the other churches were true and he understood that the sermons of the minister didn't hold up, like he's pushing it back against the system. That seems to be what a prophet is. So my definition of prophet would be very different from yours, but you're not going to catch me saying he's not a prophet. Um, I believe the Book of Mormon is scripture, but I also believe it's scripture in the same way that the Bhagavad Gita is scripture, or the Quran is scripture. They're mythical stories meant to connect us to the divine. And when taking literally, we, we miss the mark and we hurt others. So for example, in the Book of Mormon, when we say um, that we take away, that, that the, the Lamanite priest took away the virtue of the Nephite daughters. I, I don't remember the exact, but you know what I'm talking about. You can't take away someone's virtue by raping them. Someone's virtue is who they are. It's, it's, a, it's an incorrect way of using rhetoric in language and theology. So if, what, if you take it 100% literal, you're always going to miss the mark when, some, when the scripture is one off. Your ability to say, like, there's myth there and there's inspiration there, but I don't need to take everything verbatim. It gives you room to say, like, oh, that hurts people. That's not healthy. Let's set that off to the side. This piece is useful. Let's use it. I have no problem with the book one of the scripture at all. I, I still read from it. 
Do I believe it's a literal translation from gold plates? No. And I think I could demonstrably show at least enough space that you would say, yeah, there's room, there's room so to think that. So three witnesses, what they state in the, in the title page and the eight witnesses, those, so none of them were telling the truth. Here's the trouble. Those 11 men didn't only speak on those two pages. Their testimonies go far and wide in other documents, and they speak of these, in one place they'll say it was a physical experience, in another place they'll say it was a spiritual experience. In one place they'll say they saw the plates, in another place they say the plates stayed covered. Their testimonies are not cohesive. We like, as Mormons, all we do is open the book and show the one testimony. The reality is those 11 men said lots of things, and some of those things contradicted each other. But they never denied what they said they saw. But they contradicted each other. Yeah, I, I think the opportunity to understand your point of view. I think the, the purpose of the council, uh, as I mentioned at first, now, your integrity is not in question at all. We should stop. I don't know if you want to back it up a touch, John. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Let's, uh, go ahead, Bill. What are your comments and thoughts on that? You're going to want to back it up just a touch. This is the other, I think, money quote uh, where this guy starts to say it's it's been the purpose of the council. Um, what essentially is happening here, this is towards the end. Some of this, again, we're, we're losing some audio or the transcripts maybe missing a piece or two. But we're at the end here now where the stake president is saying, okay, we're done. Uh, here's what we're going to do. I need to now look to the six high councilmen whose job it is to state whether the proceedings have been fair to Brother Real or not. And that's already happened. Again, we don't have that in this bit because it was too messy to listen to um, as far as the background noise. But he's already asked three men who are the spokesmen for the six men, half the high council, whose job it is to... Um, share whether the proceedings have been fair on my side. They agree it has, and I honestly agree it has. I think the proceedings here, in terms of how the church has made them, uh, the way this council went, was fair to me to lay out my side of the argument and to have enough time to do that. He then turns over to the other six, of which there's three of them to be spokesmen, and he says, has the council been fair to the church? And so you get this high councilman who is now going to speak, his job is to represent whether the council has been fair to the church. And in, but he also then kind of goes off and says something else. And I think this line is crucial. How many seconds back? 15, 30 seconds? Uh, maybe 10, 10 seconds back. Okay. Let's, uh, let's see if I, if I grab the right spot. Uh, we'll see here. I'm doing all this uh, real time. <laughs> I'm going to just read what you've got in the transcript. He says, sure. yeah, I think this has been an opportunity to understand your point of view. I think that the purpose of the council, as was mentioned at the first, now your integrity is not in question at all. It isn't. The purpose of this council is to look at protecting the integrity of the church. Uh, and you mentioned that as well. And, uh, but I believe now that pretty much as you outlined every step of your presentation, if you take all that, there is no integrity left in the church. 
And so that's a problem. There are a lot of nuances there. You are a very intelligent man. You've looked at sources, as you've said, on both sides, all the information there. It leaves the church with zero integrity. Now, I'm just going to say that seems hard to believe that a stake high councilman would um, admit in front of all his peers and the stake presidency that the church has no integrity. Is it possible that's taken out of context? Um, I think what he's doing is he's reiterating my point of view. Your but point I think, of view. Your yeah, point of view. Yeah. yeah. But I also think what the crux is, is that he says, if the information you, you shared, if that information is true, then it in fact does leave the church with zero integrity. Uh, and so what I would suggest is that anybody who looks at this data, the question becomes, is the data true? Did the church withhold you from knowing the, the deep down parts of its story? And if you take all of that collectively uh, in, all the messiness of Mormonism, do you then recognize if that information is true, do you recognize that the church is left with zero integrity? Right. And then later, he, what, what the listeners will hear is he goes on to say that we're all here to protect, and I think it's important, critical, in fact. Well, it's, it's and I think Brother Real, as a member of the church, understands, you know, member of the church, and you're still in a better position to try to persuade other people to uh, documents that you have, but also you've been critical. I think there's going to be discussion on all sides. Yeah, and the truth is, though, there is no discussion because the moment you're critical, you're punished. Right. It's a circular reasoning. It's a logical fallacy. It, we, we like to say there's an open forum here to decide what the facts are and whether the church is true or not. And then on the other hand, the church says, but anybody who shows those facts and who raises a public voice to those criticisms, we then make you an outsider. Right. All right, so let's go ahead and let it uh, finish playing out. fair to say I don't believe anything about the church. I don't think that's fair. Sure. So why don't I share my testimony? Um, I don't know that Jesus ascended on the third day. I've studied the historical Jesus as well. That said, I've been deeply affected by his mercy and his grace. I've started another podcast called The Mythical Jesus where I take the scriptures and think and talk and speak about Jesus because I love him. So I can't ascribe to knowing. I can't ascribe to even probably believing. But I can say I hope. I have serious doubts that the Book of Mormon is a historical document in terms of an ancient translation. But I have a deep abiding testimony of it as scripture. Do our leaders talk to Jesus today? Not in the way they tell us they do. I think that is also demonstrable. But that doesn't mean that I don't think if the church is going to make a change, it doesn't come through an inspired thought through the top. And for me, that's enough to hope in these men as prophets of some sort, even if they don't act all the time with integrity. So is this the true church or not? I've not spoken on that at all. I just said it's not what it claims to be. So I have a testimony on some level of Jesus. I've been affected by his grace and mercy. I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon, even if I don't believe in a, a, a historic ancient translation, which Elder Holland has said, we make room in our church for those who have non-literal belief in the Book of Mormon. Do I believe in prophets? To some extent I do, and to some extent I don't. It's a mixed bag. I don't see the world in black and white ways anymore. Um, it would be really sad in my mind. As you point out, if this is true and all these facts come together and I'm being accurate, 
if the church lacks integrity, I wouldn't say it has no integrity, but it lacks a certain amount of integrity that we all expected it to have. And if you're acknowledging on some level that if I'm being accurate, I've told the truth, it would be a shame to excommunicate somebody for essentially shining the light on a lack of integrity and forthrightness and honesty on the church. Again, I don't think, at the end of the day, this decision, I don't think it has anything to do with me. I'm just one more guy who's shining a light, and when I'm done, six months from now, somebody else is going to be doing it. Sooner or later, our church is going to have to get comfortable with, the, with its story, with the facts of its story. And it's trying to, but it's doing it behind, in the shadows. And I don't think that's healthy for the people on the other side here. That's it. I'm sorry. No, no problem. I just and if I can just say one more time, I would just say go out on the other side there and ask people to tell you why it fell apart for them so you can have more empathy for them and their stories. So, Bill, um, you it goes on. You, the transcript uh, has something that this recording uh, didn't, and it's basically the words of your stake president at the end. Maybe I should read them really quick. Yeah, and I don't even know if the transcript accurately portrays that. I, I struggled a lot because I didn't, I couldn't hear it well enough to make major corrections. But the the last words of the stake president is going to be incoherent. It's it's not going to make sense as well as the closing prayer. Uh, whoever made the transcript, it it didn't produce a something I would be comfortable saying represents the real words. Okay, I, I we think won't we won't read them. Yeah. Here. I think as listeners were listening, you see that for the most part, the transcript does a pretty good job. It misses a few bits here and there. Um, but I think it's honest to the, to the, to the uh, what's the word? It's honest to what's going on in that room. Uh, but when we get to the last two things, is the stake president closing in the closing prayer, I think it's, it's probably the worst spot as far as transcription. <laughs> 